Hello everyone, my name is Jen Nolan and I'd like to welcome you to the final webinar in MOVE Muscle Bone and Joint Health 2017 Musculoskeletal Health webinar series. We are again grateful to AbbVie Proprietary Limited for their sponsorship which has allowed this webinar to be offered free of charge to health professionals around Australia. The topics and presenters for our webinars for the first half of 2018 are confirmed and should be listed on your screens now. Again, we are hoping that we will be able to offer the stem cells webinar in February free of charge, but either way, information about the webinars will be emailed to you all in the coming week. Before introducing our presenter for this evening, I just have a couple of other housekeeping issues to run through. Firstly, if you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, please refer to the message box on your screen. You can type a message at any time that will be read by the webinar organiser at Redback Conferencing. If you're listening via the phone, you'll notice a small time delay between the audio and the screen. This is normal, so don't be concerned. Also, while, while our presenter, Dr. Marie Falatar, can be seen on your screens now, she will be not, not be visible during the presentation. Marie is happy to answer questions during the presentation, so please type questions for her at any time. Can I suggest you don't leave your questions to the last minute as we will aim to finish strictly at 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Time. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Marie Falatar as our presenter for this, for this evening. Marie is a clinical rheumatologist working in private practice in Melbourne with a special interest in psoriatic arthritis. Her postgraduate training included a fellowship program with the University of Toronto focusing on psoriatic arthritis and lupus and working with Professor Daphna Gladman. Dr. Falatar has continued her involvement in therapeutic clinical trials and conducted investigator initiated research in psoriatic arthritis, particularly in the areas of imaging, genetics and clinical studies. Without further ado, I'll hand proceedings over to Marie. Thanks very much, Marie. Okay, thank you, Jen. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to this um, webinar. I'd, I'd love to know where everybody's from in Australia because Jen said there's good people all around um, tune in. So I think uh, congratulations to Arthritis Victoria moved for conducting these webinars and giving um, people the opportunity to be educated in this way. It's great to hear from people from different walks of life, um, medicine and otherwise. So um, I'll be talking about psoriatic arthritis. My disclosures are that I've had a, um, some education and travel grants from various country, um, companies. Sorry. So I'll be talking about psoriatic disease. And uh, look, I'm happy, I'm more than happy for people to type in their questions as we go in the question box. So much like if this was an informal kind of round table discussion, I'd, I'd, you know, I'm happy for it to be held that way. If I get a flood of 10 questions, at a time, then you'll excuse me for saying that, you know, I'll address a couple of them and then maybe we will leave some to the end, but there will be lots of time for questions because I think that's the most interesting part of the presentation. So um, I'll be talking about psoriatic disease, which is, uh, I think, an interesting uh, phenomenon. It's a bit different to rheumatoid, has a bit more complexity to it in some ways. And uh, so this slide just tries to demonstrate that, yes, it, it affects skin, um, now, so um, I'm looking for that pointer. Where's the pointer? Never mind. Um, okay, so um, on the top right corner we see um, um, uh, areas of psoriatic skin, um, which is commonly in the scalp, um, but can be many other parts of the body. Some people have very severe skin disease. Um, most people that we see with psoriatic arthritis don't. Um, with regard to the joints, it, uh, the joint disease and psoriatic arthritis manifests in a number of ways. Um, the, uh, we see inflamed joints, um, we see swollen joints in a pattern of what we call dactylitis. Um, so, okay, now I found the pointer, sorry, there, there was my delay. So this right fourth toe is very interesting, it's diffusely swollen um, and in that situation it's not just the uh, joint that's in, in that's uh, very swollen, it's the tendon, often actually it's the flexor tendon which is really grossly inflamed which gives it this um, 
image of a, of, of a sausage, so we call it a sausage digit in fact. Um, this poor person also has quite a lot of damage in their toes. Psoriatic arthritis in the, um, in the musculoskeletal system also manifests in other ways that you know, it don't occur in rheumatoid. And this uh, gentleman has a very inflamed Achilles tendon. Now sometimes as we get older we get uh, some damage in the tendon and often there is swelling in the mid portion. Um, this gentleman, you'll have to take my word for it, that swelling is mostly in the lower end and it tends to be where the tendon attaches to the bone that one can see autoimmune inflammation. So not mechanical problems, not damage related stuff, but rather autoimmune inflammation and hence the term enthesitis, inflammation at sites where ligament and tendon inserts into bone. So psoriatic arthritis is also different from rheumatoid because there is more axial disease. That means that the cervical, thoracic, lumbar sacral spine and particularly the sacroiliac joints are involved. And that's where it's a condition that's much, simil much more similar to um, ankylosing spondylitis rather than rheumatoid. So this MRI seeks to demonstrate some inflammatory change, that's the white stuff, on the right side of the sacroiliac joint. And then increasingly there's acknowledgement in many of our autoimmune diseases, uh, rheumatoid and psoriatic arthritis, but also other autoimmune inflammatory diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease, that there is a this systemic inflammatory phenomenon causes a lot of complications. And uh, what we see is um, an increased rate of ischemic heart disease, um, particularly in psoriatic arthritis, we see a lot of metabolic disease. So we see a really high rate of um, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, something that we call fatty liver. Fatty liver is increasingly uh, common in the community related to weight, um, high, high body mass index, particularly diabetes. But we, there's an extraordinary percentage, up to 30% of people with psoriatic arthritis have um, uh, steatohepatitis. And there is a genetic association uh, of psoriatic arthritis with gut disease, so particularly Crohn's. And in that way psoriatic arthritis distinguishes itself also from rheumatoid where there's no genetic association between rheumatoid and inflammatory bowel disease. Okay, so um, in I said that I discuss um, how we diagnose it. Again, please um, by all means put in your questions um, along the way. So uh, in, in uh, England in about the 60s and 70s there were a couple of physicians called uh, Dr. Mole and Dr. Wright and they started describing psoriatic arthritis. So they started writing about it saying um, something like we're seeing lots of patients with psoriasis who really have inflamed joints. So they define psoriatic arthritis very simply as inflammatory arthritis plus psoriasis. Um, now it's convenient if the patient comes in the door who ha has psoriasis um, um, or they've had it in the past. But um, as you might be aware, sometimes patients don't know that they've had psoriasis, mostly because they've never gone to a GP because of their skin disease. Um, so if they've had a couple of little red scaly areas, um, psoriasis is often on the extensive surface of the elbows and the knees and often the scalp. Uh, so I've heard it said that hairdressers uh, are good at diagnosing psoriasis. And they've told people as teenagers in the 20s that that's what they have, but the patient has never gone to the GP because the psoriasis comes and goes and um, they haven't necessarily used any topical treatment. Um, interestingly, it's, it's an extremely hereditary condition, um, psoriasis is, but even more so psoriatic arthritis. So if a patient walks in the door and they've got a few swollen joints and I'm in the process of asking questions to find out what's going on, and they don't have any psoriasis and swear black and blue that they've never had psoriasis. But if um, one of their family members has psoriasis, then they're much more likely to have psoriatic arthritis rather than rheumatoid. So in other words, is the, does the patient in front of me have rheumatoid or psoriatic arthritis when they have swollen joints? If there's a family history of psoriasis, it's much more likely to be psoriatic arthritis in that person and they're much more likely over time to develop some of these features if they go untreated rather than rheumatoid. And interestingly, uh, about 10 or 15% of patients get their arthritis before their psoriasis and I've had that happen a few times. Patients come back a, a few years later and they, um, they tell me that they have developed um, that skin problem. So um, medically it's a bit of a conundrum to just diagnose, to just label psoriatic arthritis as somebody with psoriasis who happens to have inflamed joints because there are other reasons patients can have psoriasis and flame joints. They might have inflamed joints from gout, 
they could have pseudo gout. Um, they could have seropositive rheumatoid, in fact, as well as developing psoriasis. So there was a very good study done by a New Zealand rheumatologist, Will Taylor, when he spent some time in the UK. And they plugged in a lot of data from patients that were given to them um, by physicians, well, physicians that gave um, requested information on the patients that they thought had psoriatic arthritis. And uh, to try and statistically find out what are, the, um, uh, what are the salient features of disease. And statistically, they came out with five things that seem to uh, differentiate people who really look like they have psoriatic arthritis versus looking like somebody with rheumatoid. So yes, of course, that um, happens to be psoriasis. Um, uh, um, so if you have current psoriasis, you get two points in this table. You're supposed to come away with three or more points um, out from this table. Um, so if you have a history of psoriasis, that gets to Guernsey family history, as I've mentioned. Um, if you have nail disease, so it's very interesting because when I was a medical student way long ago in the 90s, um, I was told that if patients have psoriasis and they have some psoriatic nail changes, and I'll show you those, then they're much, that's, much, that's very predictive of getting um, psoriatic arthritis later on. So that was what was put into the textbooks, that was common physician observation, and lo and behold, statistically, um, that's been observed to be the case. So the true psoriatic arthritis patients are much more likely to have a negative rheumatoid factor test. Um, they're much more likely to have dactylitis, and that's something we tend to really not see in uh, rheumatoid. And this um, radiological evidence, it's a type of um, change in the bones in psoriatic arthritis patients where there's damage that we don't tend to see um, in rheumatoid. Um, so uh, thank you for that question. So can you have rheumatoid with psoriasis? Um, so the answer is yes, and it comes down to um, if the patient has um, high level rheumatoid antibodies in the blood, for instance, um, and they have lots of inflamed joints, and rheumatoid tends to present in a symmetrical pattern. Um, I'll go into that in, um, in, a, in a few slides. Um, and uh, if they have other uh, salient features of rheumatoid, like rheumatoid nodules, if nodules is not something that we see with psoriasis, then you definitely clinically say that that patient looks like rheumatoid arthritis, but they just happen to have psoriasis. But um, your question's a really good one because there definitely are a group of patients that have a number of inflamed joints, no other highlighting features of psoriatic arthritis or rheumatoid. So they are basically somebody with psoriasis and arthritis, and you're kind of guessing that they're mostly psoriatic arthritis, but sometimes time will tell. So if after a couple of years they come back and they've got a really swollen toe and it's dactylitis, you can pat yourself on the back and say, oh, that's right, it is psoriatic arthritis. Or um, over time, sometimes patients can become rheumatoid factor positive. And so it is worth checking every couple of years, um, at least for the first few years of disease, to see if that's the case. So that's a very good question. And there now is um, an international group called GRAPA. Um, and that's a really nice collaboration of dermatologists and um, rheumatologists mostly who are very interested in research in that condition. And they've been going for about 15 years um, and they, they're doing some very useful things um, in terms of outcome measures in particular for psoriatic arthritis. So some basic stats, um, psoriasis affects 3% of the population, mostly uh, Caucasians. Um, uh, not very much in African races, um, is in some um, Asian and Middle Eastern groups, but predominantly Caucasian. So I said that it most, the skin mostly precedes the joint disease, but occasionally it's the other way around. Um, and occasionally they both um, occur together. But the very typical story is that um, a patient uh, that comes to us has often had psoriasis for 10 years, so roughly 10 years. That's a very common scenario before they get their joint disease. Okay, so clinical features, yes, it causes inflammation of joints, it causes inflammation of skin, it causes inflammation where ligaments and tendons insert into bone, enthesitis, tendonitis, and that dactylitis feature. And the extra articular features of psoriatic arthritis are different to rheumatoid. So as I mentioned, inflammatory um, bowel disease, Crohn's, the eye features of psoriatic arthritis are different to rheumatoid, so we tend to see uveitis. We don't see uveitis that much in um, psoriatic arthritis. It's a very inflammatory autoimmune state of the eye. 
um, where the patient has redness and pain and so much so that they, they really go to the doctor within a few days because it's very, very uncomfortable. So it's not something they usually get away with sitting on and wait to see if it resolves spontaneously. Um, and that usually needs topical steroids and sometimes systemic steroids. Um, so the rate of that happening in, P in PSA is maybe about 2 or 3%. Um, uveitis is much more common in ankylosing spondylitis. So I should say that um, psoriatic arthritis does fall into the group of those spondyloarthropathy conditions like angspond that tend to affect the spine. Okay, so um, any questions, keep them coming. Um, so when we see a patient and we think about differential diagnosis, so um, what are we thinking about? We're thinking about is the pain that they're describing inflammatory? So I listen to um, what the patient says about their joints and what they feel. I often ask them questions like, how do you feel in the morning compared to later in the day? Or is morning your worst time of day? Um, because often when people do develop um, inflammatory problems in their joints, then they wake up feeling profoundly stiff and sore. The reason for that is that sleep is a long period of rest and any period of rest during the day tends to bring back the inflammation or the inflammatory symptom. To be honest, I've never heard it really um, explained why exactly that's the case, but we kind of know it's the case. So um, a typical person in the morning, they're stiff, they get ready, they get into the car. So they loosen up a bit while they're sharing and having breakfast and getting to the car or on the train to go to work. And once they get out of the car or train, they feel a bit sore and stiff again. Um, and then if once they've walked 100 or 200 metres, they feel a bit better. And so that pattern is frequently repeated during the day. And that's in contrast to what we would call mechanical pain, um, where mechanical uh, refers to osteoarthritis or structural damage issues that we all suffer, particularly with age. Um, and patients generally feel worse the more they do. So when I ask the patient, is it the case that the more you do, the more you hurt? You know, when they've had a very active day, are you more sore compared to the days where it's been kind of restful and you've been able to put your feet up? So we've got osteoarthritis of the knees, Osteoarthritis of the spine, that's the sort of thing um, that you know, patients would describe. Maybe a little bit of stiffness in the morning, but typically not for half hour. So we use half hour as a bit of a cutoff um, you know, for how significant the um, morning stiffness is. And does the patient um, uh, speaking to us, you know, do we, we think, do they have fibromyalgia? Or maybe some of their symptoms, musculoskeletal symptoms, are fibromyalgia. But on top of having fibromyalgia, then they've developed um, an, an inflammatory arthritis. So fibromyalgia is uh, predominantly female, as you're probably aware, and often long-standing pain. So patients would not say that you know, fibromyalgia is not something that develops over a couple of months, but it's aches and pains that have been going on for years. Um, and it fluctuates in severity. Um, there's no um, structural damage as a consequence of fibromyalgia. I often describe it as a chronic headache in the muscles. But then that, that person with fibromyalgia might say, but you know, my fingers are now swollen or my hands don't quite feel right and I really feel that when I get up in the morning, you know, all of me aches and that's unusual. I didn't have that before. It's a different kind of pain. So they're the sort of clues we look for to diagnose somebody with you know, a different inflammatory disease. Sometimes it's easy and you can see swollen joints in the patient and sometimes you can't. So when a person comes to see us, uh, I'm not very well try, but um, hard to ascertain sometimes what, what is the agenda of the person sitting in front of me? What do they really want from me? Do they want a diagnosis? Do they want a cure? Do they want somebody that's willing to listen? Um, you know, often there is a, certainly a degree of frustration with um, other health professionals, other doctors, and sometimes patients say to rheumatologists, and I acknowledge that rheumatologists did not have a high profile in the community, that they've been to everybody and I'm their last resort. And so I say, well, who's everybody? And they, they talk about the GP and the physio and the osteopath and the chiropractor and the massage therapist, and they've been to lots and lots of people and they're still not better and there's a high degree of frustration. Okay, so inflammatory arthritis can occur at any age, profound morning stiffness, stiffness after periods of rest, we call that the gel phenomenon, generally a bit better with movement or activity, but once the degree of inflammation gets worse and severe, then obviously the activity is levels are limited. X-ray scans and bloods can be normal, and I'll discuss that 
Um, osteoarthritis, clear increase with age, um, often weight bearing joints or joints that have suffered past injuries, shoulders, elbows, wrists from falls or sporting injuries. Um, it's related to cartilage and structural damage and um, my cartilage doesn't re repair or regrow unfortunately and that's a message that can be difficult to convey to people. Um, so pictorially this is um, a normal joint, bone, bone and a blue layer of cartilage lining the joint and then the synovial membrane with a bit of synovial fluid which acts like a bit of lubricant. In the middle osteoarthritis, so cartilage is worn, um, synovial membrane not so inflamed. Uh, in something like rheumatoid or psoriatic arthritis, certainly when the inflammatory process starts, you wouldn't expect to see any bony damage straight away. But the initial process um, that occurs is inflammation of the synovium and uh, an increase in the um, uh, intra-articular fluid, um, and that fluid is inflammatory. Um, so that's synovitis um, as compared to the other processes. Okay, so this is osteoarthritis, this is frayed cartilage. I often try and describe it to people as a frayed t-shirt just to illustrate that sometimes we can go away and we think we can cut it out or remove it or fix it but at the end of the day it's more ideal to get a new t-shirt because the more you cut into a frayed cotton fibres in the t-shirt the more it um, erodes. Okay, so what are the role um, of blood tests in this condition? Well, um, certain conditions can be helpful. Um, blood tests can be an indication of severity of the inflammation. Um, more so in rheumatoid are the blood tests helpful because if the rheumatoid antibodies are high at presentation um, with the person sitting in front of me, I can more confidently say that they really look like they have rheumatoid arthritis. So we now check two things, rheumatoid factor and another thing called a CCP antibody and most GPs are very well attuned to that now. The CCP antibodies have been around for about 10 years and we know that people that have a high CCP or rheumatoid factor um, are more likely to get erosive or damaging disease and you know how it translates to the patient is that I say look these antibodies are there, this arthritis is here to stay and they're the seropositive RA patients. Seronegative RA, about 20 or 30 percent of patients are seronegative and they um, can have inflamed joints don't have psoriasis, a negative for rheumatoid factor and CCP. So we tend to lump them into this category of seronegative RA. We also look for other conditions like lupus, um, but presuming we don't find that, that then, uh, and other features of lupus, it looks like seronegative RA. For psoriatic arthritis, there's no diagnostic blood test, nothing in the blood that tells me they have psoriasis or inflamed joints. Although if the joint inflammation is severe, then often we do see higher inflammation readings, that ESR and CRP. But these readings also go up with other things that happen to um, people like infections most commonly, um, injury trauma, so they're not very specific. So it's when we do blood tests over time, if we see persistently high ESR, CRP, then that can give me a clue that the inflammatory disease is not under control. Um, fibromyalgia, of course, there's no blood test, it's a clinical diagnosis, osteoarthritis, no blood test. Okay, so some pictures. So clinical features of psoriatic arthritis. So this is to um, show you what different, what skin can look like with psoriasis. Certainly different shades of redness, um, various thickness um, of the skin and scaliness. So it's, um, it's lumpy, it's above the skin, it's not flat. Um, typically and uh, the scale comes to varying degrees. So some people have a lot of scale which is very uncomfortable for patients and some not. So nail pitting that I mentioned earlier which um, in a patient with psoriasis with nail pitting that patient is more likely to develop um, psoriatic arthritis over time. So pitting is one of the common features. Now if you're looking at your nails right now and you do see pitting um, that might be okay and it might not mean you have psoriasis. Um, the, sometimes the normal uh, population can have one or two pits. This patient obviously has a number and um, that patient has a deep pit there. Sometimes we see ridging of the nails. Um, I thought I had some other pictures of nails. I might come to that later. Um, so there's been another question. So there are no diagnostic levels of ESR and CRP and CCP for um, RA. So um, there is a, sort of a diagnostic level of CCP. Um, so with the CCP and rheumatoid factor test, 
um, you know, they come to us with a lab range. So the typical lab range for CCP is 0 to 10 maybe. And sometimes we get a result like 12 and we kind of don't know what that means and it's sort of like having a borderline temperature where you don't know if something's going to happen or not going to happen and time will tell. But if a patient walks in the door and their CCP is more like um, over 50, 100, 200, sometimes higher, oh, they're asking about PSA. Um, so, um, C, okay, so high level CCP indicates rheumatoid. High level CCP is not a feature of psoriatic arthritis. And um, definitely there are no diagnostic levels of ESR and CRP in rheumatoid or psoriatic arthritis. They might be raised, they may not be depending on the activity of the disease. Um, and, so, and so I've been asked, does PSA tend to be asymmetrical compared to RA? So yes, thanks, um, that's what we're moving on to next. So rheumatoid arthritis um, tends to involve um, uh, joints, many joints around the wrist and the MCPs and the PIPs, but not so much the distal interphalangeal joints. Whereas psoriatic arthritis does tend to be more asymmetrical and that's one of the diagnostic clues to this disease and it can affect one whole finger and often it, when, when that's the case, um, we, you know, that's when the dactylitis appears, when all the joints along the digit are affected and the DIPs. Um, so uh, this is a picture of, um, oh, the patient has some nail disease, so onycholysis where the nail kind of lifts up in that pattern, that's called onycholysis, that's very typical of psoriatic arthritis. So that's a nice picture of, of one of my patients with um, a swollen joint and this and um, uh, some a lesion of skin lesion on the ankle so that all added up to it being psoriatic arthritis. So um, some pictures because pictures tell a thousand words. So um, the uh, this rheumatoid patient has symmetrical wrist involvement. So um, symmetry means that most of the joints or mo maybe more than 50% of the joints are symmetrically affected. So it's much more likely in psoriatic arthritis that you might get a finger here, a wrist there, and a thumb, and maybe an elbow and a knee. Um, but the rheumatoid patients tend to come in with symmetrical disease from the word go. Um, so um, MCPs are swollen here, PIPs also, DIPs not affected. So they're also clinical clues to what the patient's got. If a patient comes in with a hand like this, where really grossly swollen, MCP, PIP, and there will be a lot of tendonitis there. Um, then, um, then that's very much like psoriatic arthritis. Okay, symmetry, um, hands and wrists. So in psoriatic arthritis, this is one of my patients where one hand has been terribly damaged in this patient and that hasn't happened in the other hand. And we would hardly ever see that in rheumatoid. It tends to be both sides. Um, what are the differences and similarities of peripheral joint inflammation in rheumatoid? Okay, so um, so some of the things that I've meant, so looking, tell me if I'm um, answering your question, um, both both um, disease, uh, diseases um, involve synovitis, inflammation of the membrane with lots of fluid contained. Um, in rheumatoid arthritis, um, it, sorry, in psoriatic arthritis, it was the pattern of joint involvement and the tendency to develop dactylitis. So we don't tend to see dactylitis in rheumatoid. And the other things that can give you a clue that it's psoriatic arthritis are things like enthesitis. So this is a nice um, picture of dactylitis, the damaged toe. Um, that right second toe is diffusely swollen, that's typical of dactylitis. That third toe is quite pudgy and that looks like a psoriatic um, arthritis toe. Um, so then there's the radiograph. So hopefully in early disease you don't see any joint damage. If the patient comes in the door and they do have joint damage, then it's not early disease and they've had it for quite a while. So we do see differences in the x-rays in um, between patients with rheumatoid and psoriatic arthritis. So these are normal hands, wrist, MCPs, PIPs. Uh, Typical rheumatoid patient here on the bottom left where um, a lot of the MCPs are damaged and it's right across and it's in both hands. Um, there is a bit of PIP damage there um, that might be hard to discern but um, the DIPs are pretty spared. Um, very common that there's wrist damage in rheumatoid. Often there's erosion of the ulnar styloid so that disappears. 
Um, so the erosions of the holes into bones, I often describe it as a Pac-Man eating into bone and over time you get com complete breakdown of the joint. Um, this happens to be a fairly typical psoriatic arthritis hand x-ray, it's not always like that. So the radiological features are different. Um, firstly, uh, a lot of the MCPs look pretty good. Um, that wrist, um, not much damage, there may be a bit of reduced um, joint space from cartilage damage. But the striking feature here is that in the PIP joints, the joints are fused. And that's not something that we tend to see here. Psoriatic arthritis has this curious um, tendency to uh, cause bone to cross the joint. So while some patients with psoriatic arthritis can have really eroded joints and damage like this, um, others can, can develop fusion. We certainly do see erosions more than um, fusion. Um, but fusion can occur. So an x-ray like this, one would have to say that's very typical of um, uh, psoriatic arthritis, and particularly where the other hand is barely affected, and we, we often see that. So this is a typical rheumatoid erosion. Um, this is an example of uh, what I was saying, where you have some digits that have terrible joint damage. So this um, joint here, that's been eroded and eroded. So this looks like the typical, pen it's a pencil in cup, we call it. Um, deformity where it looks like um, it's a pencil sitting in a cup and, and um, it's, it's falling off. So you have horrible damage here but the neighbouring joints look pristine and that's something that you would never see, almost never see in um, typical rheumatoid. So that's really quite a curious phenomenon. So this is the process of that pencil in cup occurring where you get a bit of eating away of the bone here and here and it becomes you know, very severe and, and looks like that. Okay, moving right along. So um, this is a patient with horrible disease and she'd had um, surgery many years ago and this is not something that we commonly see but this is what was done to her and I don't think it really helped. Um, certainly didn't help her pain. That was what her feet looked like. She had terrible damage in many, many joints. But our drugs these days do prevent that. Okay, and then um, moving along to the spine, um, what do we see in the spine? So rheumatoid and psoriatic arthritis are different. Um, rheumatoid arthritis can affect the cervical spine, but usually the upper cervical spine, the facet joints, and not the rest of, and um, not much of the rest of the cervical spine. But psoriatic arthritis can affect the cervical thoracic lumbar and sacroiliac joints. But psoriatic arthritis can affect the cervical thoracic lumbar and sacroiliac joints. So this is a typical, um, you know, 50 or 60 year old spine where um, we have some degenerative disease, some osteoarthritis. So here we have bone, bone and cartilage in between. In these areas there's an osteophyte occurring that occurs where there's disc degeneration. So this is typical degenerative disease. Um, in rheumatoid um, disease, and it is kind of hard to show you, but um, it can be a dangerous phenomenon and we really don't see it very much now at all with our current treatments. But when the upper cervical spine is eroded in a rheumatoid patient that's poorly treated, um, you get some slippage of the spine, often anteriorly. So this is base of skull. That, of course, can cause horrible damage to the spinal cord and paralysis. So it can be fatal. It can also be fatal if unrecognised and the patient goes into surgery where they have the neck hyperextended to be intubated. Um, you know, terrible things can happen. So we rarely, rarely see that now. Now what, um, uh, what uh, psoriatic arthritis does is very different. In the spine we usually don't see erosions. We see this extra bone formation. And in this way it's a little bit like ankylosing spondylitis except these um, syndesmophytes as they're called um, are, right, are much thicker and broader than what we see um, typically in um, um, ankylosing spondylitis. So in this vertebrae there's a little bit of a uh, downward bone growth occurring there. In there, this, that, um, this area has a, a bit of a syndesmophyte forming. It looks like actually that might have fractured off. Um, to show you some other pictures, in, in psoriatic arthritis we often see sacroiliitis in up to 50% of people. That's usually asymmetrical, whereas in ankylosing spondylitis we would see it in a symmetrical pattern. So on the right, um, this looks like a fairly normal um, lower right sacroiliac joint. Um, show you some that are abnormal. So um, as there is inflammation, sclerosis occurs, so thickening along the margins of the joint. The joint edges become blurred, a bit ir irregular and ratty. 
sort of as opposed to having a nice smooth edge, um, like a tram line appearance. So we get this sclerosis, um, ero well, we do see erosions along those joint margins. And then often over time, there is fusion of bone across that joint, um, across the sacroiliac joint. So doing a sacroiliac x-ray in a patient that walks in the door who has inflamed joints and you think they might have psoriatic arthritis can be useful. Okay, so um, insiders can be spoken about for a long time, but I won't. And you know that patient in the first slide that had a swollen um, Achilles tendon, and at the MRI looks very interesting. In fact, MRI has really given us a lot of information about what's going on in these entheses. So where the tendon attaches to the bone, so this is the Achilles tendon, um, this is the calcaneum, the heel, um, that's the talus and the distal end of the tibia, so these are bone. And this white stuff here is inflammation. And that's really quite marked inflammation. And it's on both sides. It's in the tendon and it's also in the bone. Um, so we do see a lot of bone edema, which we think is inflammatory change in the bone surface occurring. The patients that have Achilles tears and strains, often related to age, um, they would often have some damage to the tendon away from the insertion, so more in this region. Okay, so management and treatment. So, um, so general general measures, exercise. Um, always asked a lot about di healthy di diet, as I'm sure you are. It often comes back to general principles. Um, even in the media, again, recently there's been a bit of good press about the Mediterranean diet. Someone must have done a study. So the Mediterranean diet seems to have a good mix of what we need um, as an anti-inflammatory diet, so to speak. Um, there's more seafood than red meat, and so the omega-3 fatty acids of seafood have an um, anti-inflammatory effect. They also have a positive benefit on cholesterol and um, some heart cardiac protection. Uh, whereas the omega-6 fatty acids of red meat, they tend to be more pro-inflammatory. So I usually say to patients, everything in moderation. We're not a big fish-eating society like the Eskimos, um, so you know that's where fish oil supplementation can be of benefit. No one likes to hear, including me, that a low-calorie diet is what our immune system likes um, enjoys. But a healthier immune system is definitely one that exists in a low-calorie environment. And that mostly means cutting out the carbs, especially also some also fats, but um, our Western society is very much a carb-based society. So it's all, never as simple as getting rid of the tomatoes or the lemons or those acid foods or nightshades. It's, it's really about the whole diet. Um, therapies to relieve pain are very important. Um, we, also, we can certainly start with Panadol and, and anti-inflammatories. Um, but I always say to the patient, the aim here is to make them as well as possible and to feel as normal as possible so they can participate in life in, any, in every way they otherwise would have. So we want to prevent the long-term consequences of disease, certainly joint damage, so, and that definitely reduces the need for joint replacements, improves mobility. And the, uh, many of the therapies in rheumatoid, including methotrexate and including the biologic agents, have actually significantly reduced mortality in rheumatoid arthritis. And it's looking like it's heading that way in psoriatic arthritis too. So patients in rheumatoid would typically die 10 years earlier than their counterparts and often from ischemic heart disease. So lifestyle, 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 um, health and fitness, um, fish oil supplements, uh, lean body weight, body mass index. So um, there's an interesting um, data from um, patients um, in the United States, so from an academic group, I might be about to sneeze, um, with, who have a psoriatic a psoriasis cohort, so patients just with skin disease that they've been following for years. And they record um, lots of information about these people. So what they've been able to publish after 15 or 20 years of following people, that the ones that were more likely to develop psoriatic arthritis who had psoriasis, so maybe they developed psoriasis at 15 or 20 or 25 or 30. One of the strongest predictors of that was weight. And so the more weight we gained over time, the more your body mass index rose, the more likely you are to develop psoriatic arthritis. So that's very interesting. And there is a whole lot of research on what is happening in that adipose fat tissue. That there are a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines a lot of pro-inflammatory stuff being produced by that fat tissue. We used, to, we used to think of adipose tissue as just being a warehouse of storage, a potential energy storage that doesn't get utilised, but it is more than that. It's, it's a metabolically active tissue. 
So, um, so it's relevant to patients who are older and have children and their children have psoriasis and they say, what can I say to my children? Um, probably don't smoke. Maybe smoking is a definite risk factor in rheumatoid, probably in psoriatic arthritis also. Um, and tell them to keep their body mass index down and ideally in the normal range. Um, because even BMI at age 18 um, was a predictor of um, psoriatic arthritis great, uh, later on. So that was interesting. Um, so I've only got a few minutes left. So um, dosage of fish oil supplement, please. Okay, so um, good question. Um, the, uh, there's no data. So there's opinion and there's data. So what we know is that um, the, the higher the dose, the greater the anti-inflammatory effect. Um, so taking into account compliance issues, you know, when, when patients buy a bottle, it often says they can take between one and 12,000 milligrams a day, so how much should I take? Um, the, um, I often suggest just pragmatically to buy 2,000 milligram capsules and take two a day. That way they're getting a dose of, um, of 4,000 units, um, you know, and if a patient is compliant enough and they're taking that most days, then that, they often see an anti-inflammatory benefit um, over time. And the benefit does take six to eight weeks. And I would often also really encourage the patient to do that because it's um, cardioprotective and has a positive benefit on their cholesterol. So similarly, I've been asked um, what brand of fish oils, and again, there's no data. Um, no data at all. So um, there's a lot of false claims uh, on the shelves in chemists um, about this drug helps arthritis or we're better than the others. Um, and it comes down to the content of the tablet. Uh, that, and so the higher the concentration of fish oils contains, um, the greater the benefit the, the person will receive. Um, so definitely no comparative data. I guess the other thing um, always to be aware of with our complementary natural sort of therapies is that these um, agents aren't regulated. So um, what, the, what the company says there is not what's in there. So we would hope that some of the big companies like Blackmores and Swiss are pretty reliable in their, the content of their medications. Um, but certainly for other supplements, um, there's been many, many publications where chemists and pharmacists have taken stuff off the shelves, taken it back to the lab, analyzed what's in there, and it's not what they say is in there. Um, there's a whole lot of um, supplement, there's a whole lot of just miscellaneous stuff. Um, one can typically find aspirin commonly. One can even find low doses of corticosteroid. Why? Because that's what we know does give people an analgesic effect. So that issue of reliability is a problem one. So fish oils, the more you take, the more the benefit. Um, ideally have a high level of fish in your diet, but if you can't manage that, then fish oils can be very useful. So um, physical activity, always very important um, in, in uh, keeping up muscle mass for a whole range of health benefits. Um, exercise improves depression, it makes your bowels regular, um, it gives you more energy, it helps you sleep, it helps fatigue. Um, so my dentist has a, a, a plaque on the wall that says, nothing that the dentist do, does can make up for what the patient doesn't do. And so this is, this is very much, it's very much our role to encourage um, people to do this, to remind them that it's necessary. I mean, sometimes we get so busy in life that we uh, forget that our bodies really do need exercise. We take it for granted, but exercise is really a necessity and not an optional extra. Um, so providing means, so that, you know, uh, I often refer people to physiotherapists as a means of accountability, as a means of support and guidance and giving more hands-on advice rather than me sitting across a desk lecturing people about what to do and what not to do. It's much more helpful to have somebody they can meet with every now and then to check on how they're going and, and um, you know, make sure that they're building up their muscles is what they're doing. Okay, so a um, few more minutes and um, by all means send through questions. So um, with treatment, there might be a lot of questions on treatment, so I don't have a whole ton of slides. So just as a bit of an overview, um, medical treatment regimens um, often start with anti-inflammatory medications, non-steroidal. So that's things like over-the-counter Nurofen, Voltaren, people might have often taken before they come to see me or the GP. Um, and then there's lots of prescription ones. Um, they do get a bad rap these days because there's lots of data indicating that um, they do increase the rate of ischemic heart disease. Um, they certainly can cause some renal impairment and uh, gastric um, 
risk for peptic ulcers, etc., and high, increase high blood pressure. So why do we take them at all? And it really comes down to the degree of risk. So the degree of risk relates to uh, how healthy the person sitting in front of me is. So if it's a 30-year-old uh, fit person who exercises a lot, no core morbidities, then they're going to have a very low risk of taking anti-inflammatories. The 65-year-old who is diabetic already has quite a high BMI and um, is on antihypertensive medications, so their risk is going to be a bit higher. It's very hard to quantify those risks in any individual. But my, I often say, um, suggest that it's a bit like um, everybody going out on the road, that you know we have about a 1 in 15,000 chance of dying each day, but we still go out on the road most days to get to work and get to places we need to go because the risk is really low. And if someone said to me, Marie, tomorrow your risk of dying on the road is double what it was yesterday, that might seem shocking. But if the risk is supremely low then it's today, then it's still going to be supremely low tomorrow. So this risk um, benefit stuff is really, really hard to communicate with people. It's hard for people to get their heads around, um, and you and I also. But anti-inflammatories can be very beneficial. Um, methotrexate has a role. It's a traditional drug we've, um, we've been using. These drugs, methotrexate, sulfasalazin, we don't use cyclosporin much anymore, leflunamide, they are drugs we've borrowed from rheumatoid. And, and mostly they work, but mostly for synovitis. Um, methotrexate can help for psoriasis. Um, sulfasalazine doesn't. Cyclosporin does, and that gets used by the dermatologist. Um, leflunamide doesn't do anything for the skin. Um, and, but they, what these, these drugs aren't very good at all at treating the um, spinal disease. So if somebody has a lot of spinal inflammation, often sacroiliac inflammation, it doesn't help very much at all. And endocytis, it doesn't tend to help those at all. So then along came the biologic agent. So this was around the time that um, I graduated from rheumatology, that the TNF inhibitors and the first ones were Enbrel and Humira and Infliximab and then later Simsia and Symphony. So they became approved for rheumatoid and psoriatic arthritis around 2004, 5 and 6. And they've been blockbusters in this disease because they, um, they have managed to um, ameliorate um, a disease. So they weren't developed for psoriasis, they were developed for rheumatoid, but lo and behold, they're very, very effective. So they can change a patient from this to this over a period of three to six months, from this to this, and, and most patients do respond well um, for their skin disease. Um, these are some joint measures that we use, but when a, um, a Humira, Enbrel, Infliximab are measured against placebo, there's certainly a very good response. Um, and the patient is happier. And at the end of the day, that's what we want. Then along, um, in the last couple of years, we have a couple of other options now. We have newer drugs, um, biologic agents, to treat psoriatic arthritis. So one is called Ustekinumab, that's marketed as Stelara. It works in a different way. The previous drugs I mentioned were tumor necrosis factor inhibitors, TNF inhibitors. These block a different cytokine in the system. I won't be going into how that goes. Solara is really effective for psoriasis, and it's the most common um, agent used in, um, by the dermatologists in Australia because it's an injection every three months, and it captures good control of the skin. May not be so effective for the joints. The, then there are the IL-17 inhibitors. And secukinumab, um, marketed as Cosentix, um, has begin, been available in the last 18 months um, or so, or two years for dermatologists, and about a year for us rheumatologists. And secukinumab um, is really, really effective for psoriasis, and it works incredibly fast. So some of those slides that I showed you where the skin is terrible, so often that patient will have improved within three or four weeks. With the TNF inhibitors, this often takes three to six months. But within three or four weeks, that skin you know, pretty much disappears, so quite extraordinary. So there's a lot to talk about with these um, medications. So there's a few questions that have come through that are great. Now, how many years can methotrexate be prescribed for? So um, a long time, as long as it's safe. So um, the, uh, if, if a patient has no um, other liver disease and if they don't drink a lot of alcohol, and a lot of alcohol means um, eight to ten drinks a week or less is safe. If you're going to be on, um, that's pretty safe. Uh, if you're going to be on long-term methotrexate therapy, so um, the patient that comes in who might say that they have three or four studies at night after work routinely, and more on weekends with their mates, 
that's the kind of patient you're really going to worry about having um, putting on methotrexate long term. Having said that, if I started um, methotrexate not knowing their alcohol intake or the person wasn't honest, but then later came back with their wife and their wife told me, then having methotrexate for three months doesn't do any damage. Um, it's it's long term an increased risk of liver scarring and fibrosis. Um, but you know history has told us that patients can be on methotrexate for 10 or 20 years. They do need to be monitored. Um, they need to see a rheumatologist. Sometimes the patients go back to the GP and they don't want to see a rheumatologist anymore. And that's generally not a good scenario, um, just because you know GPs they do a lot of good things, but they're just not quite as familiar with the nuances of steroidic arthritis and methotrexate dosing. And uh, sometimes we need to drop the dose with age. Um, so history has taught us that methotrexate saves lives in rheumatoid, um, you know, reduces damage deformity and adds years of, um, of living to people's existence. Um, are there any guidelines on exercise prescription for PSA? For example, light resistance, low impact. So um, Megan, if you're a physiotherapist, you probably know more about this than I do. Are there any guidelines? Not in my world, so there might be in the physiotherapy world. But sadly, when um, rheumatologists put out guidelines for management, they're mostly management of the um, pharmaceutical agents, you know, how we deal with when and where to prescribe anti-inflammatories, methotrexate and the biologics. Um, so um, we're getting shorter time, so I won't go too much into exercise. Um, would I also consider referring to an accredited exercise physiologist for this patient group? Um, yes, I would. Um, to be honest, I'm not clear if that um, those uh, practitioners have any particular overriding benefit over physiotherapists. But when I ask the person um, how they've gone with their um, physiotherapist or physiologist, I would want to hear that a the patient is attending regularly or has least, at least has gone for their you know patient care plan you know five to six visits. Um, and thereby showing some motivation and hopefully um, that practitioner, the physio, has engaged my patient to um, in, you know, enroll in an exercise program. Um, even if they're doing it independently, of course they can do it in a group. But what I want to see is patient engagement at the end of the day. So whoever engages my patient to do some um, independently, uh, independent exercise, um, then that's, that's beneficial. Does improving the condition of skin, i.e. the steroid skin lesions, affect the joint inflammation and the progression of joint disease? So great question. So the short answer is no. Um, so while um, a couple of statements there, patients with worse um, skin disease um, are a bit more likely to develop more severe psoriatic arthritis, but um, still the majority of patients who develop psoriatic arthritis are the ones with mild psoriasis. So that's by far the most common. And if we have a patient with severe psoriasis, if we make their skin better, we don't. We definitely it doesn't automatically flow that um, the joints are better. Although these biologic agents, because they're so astounding in their efficacy generally for skin and joints, if a patient is dramatically better in the skin, they're probably on biologic agents, which often help the joints. Um, now, I was asked, what was, was that sulfasalazine doesn't help? Um, okay, so sulfasalazine can be useful for joint inflammation. Um, so it can help to clear away synovitis and tenosynovitis. Um, it doesn't tend to be effective for um, axial spinal inflammatory disease. Um, that's where the biologic agents are much better than um, methotrexate or salazapirin or rather lesunamide. Um, the biologic agents are also a whole lot better at treating um, enthesitis and, uh, and of course the skin. So really quite um, wonderful to have a, a group of agents that can help the patient in many ways and not just one, one aspect of their disease. So they really do treat um, all the musculoskeletal um, manifestations. Um, that doesn't mean of course that the patient is always perfectly controlled um, because many patients do have a partial response. Um, but they have been showed they have been shown to prevent damage in psoriatic arthritis. Um, so none of our older drugs have been shown to do that. The um, the downside of therapy, of course, is that um, it's it's always a bit traumatic for patients to receive this kind of diagnosis. 
um, it's an interruption to their life, it's not what they expected, they have to turn up to a doctor's office, they have to often have regular blood tests and there are always potential side effects and they are naturally of great concern to, um, to people. So um, with the biologics, the general statistics, 1% um, of patients per year can develop a serious infection. A serious infection is defined as something that's bad enough to put you into hospital. That risk is greater with rheumatoid than psoriatic arthritis, but the risk is also higher depending on the health of the patient. So if the patient smokes, um, is overweight, has diabetes, then their infection risk is much higher than somebody who doesn't. Um, thank you for your question. So does the biologic drugs cause hair loss? And the short answer is no, um, not at all. They work in a very different way. It's, it's to do with their mode of action. Um, so methotrexate and leflunamide are our drugs which are very well known to cause hair loss, unfortunately, alopecia. But the biologic drugs don't. Um, there are other common um, causes of hair loss such as thyroid disease, iron deficiency, so many women need to be checked for iron deficiency um, to make sure that's not a contributing factor. So we've got a couple of more uh, minutes if anybody wants to shoot through some questions. So it is a bit of a road, um, but I've been uh, quite astounded in that since the time that I was a medical student and um, early doctor in the mid-90s to now how far we've come in at least having a range of options to um, offer patients. Marie, th thank you very much. That, that was so interesting, um, uh, just to, particularly sort of just to get that sort of distinction between the rheumatoid arthritis and the psoriatic arthritis. And, and just the uh, the vital importance of some um, early diagnosis to, um, as you sort of say, prevent that uh, that joint damage with with the right sort of treatment and management these days, and certainly um, prevent the more sort of um, deleterious effects of of the of the conditions. Can I ask people if if there's any um, other questions? If you could, oh yes, so, we have another one so here. Question, yep. Um, yep. Could you ever start with the nails and not, and yes, absolutely. So. Um, you know, as I was trying to say, that some people may have had skin psoriasis, but they haven't really noticed it. They might have had some scaly bits on the elbows and knees that never really bothered them. Um, so, but when they turn up with nails, so I, ch I try and look at their nails. Hopefully, I don't forget. And when they've got nail disease, then I, I, I suggest to them that this actually might be psoriasis. And uh, the appearance of the nail disease can often be mistaken for fungal disease. You know, patients are on antifungal treatment, um, but it's actually the psoriatic nail disease which has caused that. Um, onycholysis, that flakiness of the scales. What is the average um, age that someone would be diagnosed with PSA? Okay, I'm very sorry that I didn't say that. So um, about 40 to 60, um, so common age. So it's a really it's the same as rheumatoid. So we're dealing with middle-aged people like me who develop PSA. And I can see um, uh, as a sort of a standard procedure, the last comment there is also about um, uh, someone missing the, the beginning and um, could they be sort of sent a hard copy. So if for anyone who registers for our webinars, you receive a copy of the recording and also uh, Marie is happy to uh, also send out a PDF of her presentation tonight. Uh, we're only a couple of minutes away from 8pm so if there's not any last minute questions, everyone you'll notice that the uh, exit survey is actually on your screens now. Um, in the event, and I think Marie, that's it. So, uh, as someone also commented here, that uh, thank you. It, it, the, the topic was very clearly explained, explain, and you certainly covered a lot. So, thank you so much for your presentation this evening. Thank you. It was really, really interesting. <laughs> I'd like to thank everybody for joining the webinar tonight. Yeah, thank you for your questions. Yep. Yes. So, thanks to everybody, and uh, thank everyone for joining the webinar tonight. And, and ask if you could just take a moment to uh, complete the exit survey. Um, and uh, on that note, I think think we'll uh, we'll say good night. And um, oh, we've got one very last question. Just Marie, if you could just squeeze oh, that one that, in. What's that one? Oh, um, apart from anti-inflammatories, how could you manage pain? Oh, so. Um, if inflammation is the problem, then you want to get rid of the inflammation. So you need to treat it accordingly, depending on how severe that inflammation is. Um, the pain might be due to other factors, and that's tricky. We're dealing with middle-aged people that also get 
back pain, knee osteoarthritis. So we have to make sure you know, are you treating osteoarthritis? Is that where the pain is coming from? Great, well done. Uh, thanks everyone. On that note, we're right on 8pm. So I uh, wish everyone a good evening. Thanks again, Marie. Thanks Merry everyone Christmas. else for joining the webinar and good night. Good night.